was awesome. You can be seated. Thank you so much. You sang, that was beautiful. And I hope you paid attention to the words as we sang them, because nothing truly compares. And that's our prayer for you to see that this week. We're going to hear from our, our preacher in just a moment, have him introduce. But I want to just encourage you right now to put away any distraction and really focus your attention. I know that some of you have long days, uh, long day and uh, come from far distances, but this is really what it's all about these next few moments. And so grab your Bibles, grab a pen if you'd like to take notes. Uh, we're going to have a video and then we'll have our, 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 uh, our preacher for this evening introduced. But uh, let's, uh, let's watch this video and uh, see God do something great in this service. Christ, God in the flesh, left the splendor of heaven and came to our broken, corrupt world. He bore our sin, took our pain, and paid our debt. Through his sacrifice, God provided our salvation, our eternal life. Through him, we have forgiveness, acceptance, direction, and provision. How could we possibly be ashamed of him? The culture around us is boldly unashamed. They have messages to promote, causes to celebrate, and celebrities to idolize. But there is no message more worthy of promotion than the gospel. There is no cause greater to celebrate than the cause of Christ. And no person in all of history more worthy of praise and adoration than Jesus Christ. He is our brilliant creator, our loving master, and our merciful savior. He knows us, he pursues us, and he loves us. He calls and empowers us. We are his followers. We are His purchased possession. We are His workmanship. We are His messengers. We are His co-laborers. And we are not ashamed. Now, why is it that the world ridicules the gospel? Well, it is partly because of the message which the gospel conveys. One who was born in utter, abject poverty. Born in a stable. No room in the inn. We proclaim a carpenter, one, I say, who lived a life of poverty and who died upon a cross. And the world, of course, scoffs at it and ridicules it in its heart because we assert that this self-same person is the savior of the world and the son of God. That's what we proclaim. Therefore, I am not ashamed. It's our prayer that when you leave this conference, you'll leave with that phrase in your heart, I am not ashamed, because Satan wants you to be ashamed of Jesus Christ. He doesn't want you to witness, to pray, to sing. He wants you to ruin your life. He wants you to ruin your life in whatever way possible. And by the way, Satan is a liar, and he'll try to lie to you during the preaching tonight. He'll try to lie to you during this conference. And we believe that Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father except by Him. And that's why 27 years ago we began this youth conference. And thousands of lives have been changed in this conference. People have made life-changing decisions to live for Jesus. And yes, Satan has fought them, but I want to tell you something. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. And so I want to welcome you tonight to Lancaster Baptist Church and West Coast Baptist College. And we're no better than you. We love you. We're all sinners saved by grace. We're thankful for your church, your pastor, your parents. And I know that in every youth group, there's probably a teen or two that maybe is here tonight. They're not even sure they know Christ as their Savior. Maybe there's a teen or two in your youth group that just 
not really sure about really surrendering to the Lord. And I just want you to know that our church family, a few nights ago, we passed out the registration names, every one of your names, to members of our church. And that as you hear the preaching tonight, there's hundreds of people calling your name before the throne of God and asking God to touch you and asking God to help you. And we make no apology for having fun and going to Six Flags and doing a lot of that, but be sure of this one thing. This whole conference is about getting God's word into your heart and into your life. And so we're honored that you're here. We're delighted that God is working and we're praying that you will know Christ, that you will live for Christ, and that some of you, yes, without shame, will surrender your entire lives to serve the Lord Jesus Christ. And I'm so glad to help us with this conference as we begin tonight. Uh, we have a wonderful speaker. I'm so thankful for him. Uh, Pastor Dean Miller has been a dear friend for many years. He's here because he loves the Lord. He's here because he takes a stand for the truth. You don't have to wonder where he stands on the teachings of the Word of God. He's here because he loves your generation. And I'm so glad that we have the opportunity to welcome him to be the opening speaker tonight at the Ascend Youth Conference here at West Coast Baptist. Would you join me in welcoming Pastor Dean Miller from Denver, Colorado? <laughs> welcome and fire away. Amen. Thank you. Man, it's such a blessing to be in a room with a ton of people again. Isn't this great? Some of you, some of you um, uh, have been social distancing too long. And uh, well, I don't think so. Most of you probably didn't do that. You just enjoyed the COVID break because you got to eat all your snacks. And uh, you, ate up, you ate up all the Doritos. How many of you gained some weight during COVID? All right, yeah, we can see that. We can see that for sure. We can see that. Uh, who was the person who brought all their leftover snacks from their cabinet on the trip, on this, on your trip, on the bus or in the van? Who's the person in your youth group that was snacking the whole way here? Just point them out right now. I remember, um, I remember being on, uh, I remember being on teen trips. Some of, these were some of the greatest times of my life when our, when our teens would load up and head off to youth conference somewhere and we would pack into a bus. Back when, I was, back when I was a teenager, we had these, uh, man, I saw like some of these coaches pulling in today, like AC and TVs and reclining seats. Listen, we were in old school buses that the public school didn't want anymore. And we bought them at an auction for 75 bucks. <laughs> Threw some duct tape on there and headed on down the road. We couldn't get everybody in the bus and all of our luggage in the bus, so we took out the last three seats on each side in the back and then we jammed everybody in, like four to a seat, and we put all the junior hires sitting on the floor down the middle. <laughs> I always got stuck somewhere with the kid who had peanut M&Ms or peanut butter M&Ms and like those, those little crackers with the peanut butter center. And for like 24 hours in a bus, he was doing nothing but eating peanut butter and breathing on my face. <laughs> And the back seats were full of our, the back of the bus was loaded up with our luggage. And uh, we're just busting down the road in, a, in an old broken down school bus with a governor on it doing 45 miles an hour <laughs> across Arizona with no AC, we got the windows down. If somebody got sick in the front of the bus and they threw up outside the bus, it came in the window in the back of the bus. <laughs> Some of you have never experienced any of that. Then if you hit, the, when the bus driver hit the brakes really hard, all the luggage that was in the back flew forward. There was always that one girl who never remembered to duck. Like all the boys we knew, we just ducked, suitcases would fly over, that girl's like, you know. She got Samsonite stamped on the back of her head. Those were great trips. This is a true story. We were driving, we were driving in our school bus. I was in 10th grade. I was sound asleep, my head against the window. Just kind of banging on the, you know, on the side of the bus. The bus is bouncing down the road. And uh, I remember my buddy like, hey, hey, Dean, 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 look, 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 look. And I look out the window, 
And you understand, there's like, there's like, it's a 65 passenger bus with the last three seats taken out and all of our luggage in the back. We're all jammed in there. There's probably 50 of us jammed in this bus. We're driving down the road. My friend wakes me up, look, and there's this tire flying down the road. It's just bouncing down the road. And I'm kind of like half asleep, like, wow, look at that. And then I see another tire bouncing down the road. And I'm like, who's losing their tires? And then our bus goes, <laughs> they were our tires. And our bus is sliding down the road and it's in, it's in Colorado and it's dry in Colorado. So our bus not only is out of control, we're sparking down the highway and we set the ditch on fire next to the bus. So our youth pastor flies to a stop, opens up the door. He's also the bus driver and he's yelling at all of us to get whatever we've got to go put the fire out. And so like I grabbed the junior hire and I ran with him. <laughs> That was awesome. <laughs> his, his nickname from that time on was Sparky. That guy was great. But somebody grabbed my sleeping bag. And everybody's just out there with like bags and, with every, and we're just beating this fire out on the side of the road. We got the fire out, then we got to camp and I unrolled my sleeping bag. And um, it, was a, it was a holy night for me. <laughs> There's nothing in the world like coming to youth conference and loading up on your bus like you did this morning. How many of you left your church before 6 a.m. this morning, before 6 a.m.? All right, a few of you, a few of you left. What time did you guys leave? I bet it was before, it was, it was before, was it before 5 a.m.? Was it before 5? Yeah, man, you, 4 o'clock in the morning. Some of these people in that group over there, some of these teenagers over there saw something today happen for the first time in their life. They saw this, like, this little bit of light and this big orange thing coming out of the ground. They've never seen that before. Some of you thought that you just got up in the morning and pff, the sun was up there. But uh, yeah, it comes up really slow. But some of you, you left early today, you loaded up on the bus, you came to youth conference, and man, what a time. We're gonna have a great time together the next couple of days. And I wanna just, uh, I wanna thank all the youth workers and all the pastors and um, all, the, uh, all the sponsors who've come with your group. And uh, you took some vacation time, maybe from your job to come down here. How many, of you, how many of you took vacation from your job to come with your group? Young people, look around. They could have been at Disneyland. <laughs> But they're going to stay in a hotel with you tonight. And you're going to be putting like toothpaste in their shoes and all kinds of other stuff. Don't do that. But there's some people who love you and uh, they've prepared this conference. I'll, I'm so thankful for Pastor Chapel and for uh, the church family here to let us come in here and throw confetti in their building and jump around and uh, tear up the platform and swing from the ceiling. Man, that was awesome. Uh, and I just, it's just been great. I wanna thank Brother Larry for all your work that you've put in and just having a great vision for this conference. You know, God did some great things in my life at youth conferences. God did great things in my life at youth camp. Some of the greatest decisions I made in my life were in places just like this. And I've been praying for months and months that God would do something in your heart. And this church is praying for you. Your families are praying for you. Your church is praying for you. And we want to see God do great things. Take your Bible tonight and open up to Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1. I had not seen the opening video. And I was sitting over there tonight watching that and just thinking, man, it's amazing how God puts everything together. I've never preached this sermon uh, at a youth conference, actually, I've preached from this text many times, but never this message. And yet God gave me this message for this youth conference, knowing that you were going to be here. And God wants to speak to your heart tonight. And right now, I want you to ask the Lord to speak to you specifically. Here's what I want you to pray. I'm going to pray in just a minute. I want you to pray this. Maybe, you've, maybe, maybe, you're, not, maybe you're not in the routine of praying often. But while I'm praying, I want you to pray in your heart. Pray fervently. I want you to pray and, and mean it. And just say to the Lord, God, open my ears to hear you. And God, speak to me like I'm the only one in this room. 
Would you pray that tonight? We're going to pray right now. And you pray and ask the Lord that. Just in your heart, you pray. And pray fervently and sincerely. God, open my ears and speak to my heart. Lord, I pray tonight that your word would have free course. And Lord, that it would have the opportunity to get to every heart tonight. Heavenly Father, you're a good and wonderful God. The Bible says very clearly that the Lord is good and a stronghold in the day of trouble. And you know them that trust in you. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. And I pray tonight that a good God would speak to these young people. Speak to them about the good things that you have for them. And they would have a willing heart to respond. In Jesus' name, amen. Romans chapter 1, we're going to look at a few verses in this passage of Scripture tonight. But before we read the verses, I want to tell you that Paul was writing this book to the people who lived at Rome. In fact, a specific group of people who lived in Rome. Look at verse number 1 of Romans chapter 1. Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated into the gospel of God. Now he starts right away in this book about the gospel of God. We're going to hear about that tonight. And he said in verse number, he said in verse number seven, to all that be in Rome, beloved of God, called to be saints, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. He's writing to people at Rome who have been saved and who are loved by God and who are the saints. They are God's people living in Rome. Now think about Rome for a minute. Rome at this time when Paul was writing, Rome is the, the capital. It is the, it is the seat of the empire. I mean, when we think of Rome and you think back to the days of the gladiators and you think back to your images of Rome and the Colosseums and the great city and it was where all the politicians were and the great senate of Rome and it was, uh, it was the home of everyone who was somebody in the world uh, was in, living in Rome. This, is, this was a, a, a wealthy city. It was the seat of everything in the empire. It was where all the money flowed. The, the parties were there. The coliseums were there. The circuses were there. And uh, the sporting events, all the things that took place in Rome. It was the central focus of the world. And living there were some people that God loved and who loved God and God had saved. Paul wanted to go to Rome so bad. Paul was in Corinth when he wrote this letter and he wanted these people that were in Rome, perhaps this church started from some people who came uh, that were Jewish uh, believers and they had come to, uh, uh, they, they had come to uh, Jerusalem at the days of Pentecost and, and the Holy Spirit fell upon the church and, and they preached and people were saved. And the Bible tells us in Acts 2 that there were people from Rome who got gloriously saved. And that group of people, about 3,000 that were saved today, some of those were Jews who had traveled from Rome. They got saved and perhaps they had taken the gospel back to Rome and it began to evangelize others and people had gotten saved and there was a church there and, and I know may, perhaps at the end of the book Paul writes to Aquila and Priscilla and a church in their house and, and there were believers gathering together in this massive capital city the city of the world in that time Paul longed to go there I mean it was the great place Rome Rome, they had conquered the world. They were the ruling power. All roads led to Rome. And Paul writes to them this book. He writes this letter to give them the, the whole basis of the Christian faith. And Paul starts off with the gospel of God in verse 1. And then he writes down, and I want you to see it very quickly in, in, verse, number, uh, in verse number 10. Paul's, uh, Paul said, making request, if by any means now at length, I might have a prosperous journey by the will of God to come to you. Paul longed to come to them and to teach them more about the gospel and to ground them more in their faith and to help these churches to flourish and blossom and pop propagate Rome with the gospel of Jesus Christ. 
You know, I'm sure it had to be a pretty intimidating thing to live as a Christian in Rome. That had to be a pretty intimidating place to be a Christian. And Paul couldn't wait to get there. He said in verse number 14, he said, I am debtor both to the Greeks and to the barbarians, both to the wise and to the unwise. So as much as in me is, I am ready to preach the gospel to you that are at Rome also. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. For it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Paul was sharing to these Roman people. He was saying to them, I want you to know something that I want to come to you and I want to teach you more about this gospel. But there's some things I want you to know about my heart as I'm writing this letter. When you read my words in this letter, when you read this epistle in your churches, he said, I want you to know some things about my heart. And he gave them three things. I want you to mark these three things in your Bible. Because number one, Paul said in verse 14, I am debtor. Let's all say that out loud together. Ready? Paul said, I am am then he said in verse 15 he said I am ready mark that in your Bible I am ready let's say that together I am ready. and then in verse number 16 he said I am not ashamed I am not ashamed say that with me ready I am not ashamed Paul says, this is my heart. In other words, what Paul was saying to these people at Rome was he said, I am all in for the gospel. I'm all in for the gospel. I'm all in for the gospel. I'm all in for the gospel. Well, young people, what is the gospel? Well, the, the gospel is simply this. The, the gospel is that Jesus died and was buried and rose again from the dead. You say, well, well, well that's a wonderful thing, but, but how do you be all in for that? Well, I want to tell you uh, tonight, I want the Holy Spirit of God to put some things on your heart so that you can walk out of here tonight. You can leave this conference tonight and you can go back out to your homes and your families and your schools and your city and, and, and your church and you can go back to where God has you and what God calls you to do and you can say I too am all in for the gospel because I am a debtor, I am ready and I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Notice what Paul said first of all. What did he mean by I am a debtor? Look at verse 14. Paul said I am a debtor both to the Greeks and to the barbarians, both to the wise and to the unwise. Paul was simply saying this, I'm a debtor to those people who don't have the gospel. I owe a debt to give them the gospel. I, am a, I have a debt for every man, every man. I have a debt to pay. I'm a debtor to the gospel. I'm a debtor to the gospel. Now, Paul, Paul was simply saying this, I'm obligated. I'm obligated. I have an obligation to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Paul was obligated because he had already introduced himself in verse number one. Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ. That is the word bond slave. In these days, if a man owed a debt to somebody, he could be ordered to become that man's slave and to have to work that debt off. But there were many people back in those days who would be working their debt off for a man that they owed, but it was a good man. It was a man that took care of them. He treated them well. He gave them a job, and he was allowing them to pay off his debt. And at the end of his time, when his debt was completely paid, that man could make a decision and become that person's permanent employee. And he could bond himself to them, and he was called a bond slave. He was willingly choosing to serve this person. And that's what Paul said about Jesus. He said, I am his slave. He set me free, but I've willingly offered myself back to him. He set me free. But I'm willingly offering myself back to him. Paul was a bond slave. You have to remember who Paul was. Listen, before he was Paul, he was Saul. I want you to think for just a minute, everyone in this room who already is saved and knows Jesus Christ, I want you to think for a minute, who were you before you got saved? Paul was a blasphemer. Paul was a, 
vile man. He was an injurious person. He inflicted harm on other people. Paul perhaps was a murderer. Paul arrested people who named the name of Christ and hailed them to prison. And Paul disrupted families and he put dads and moms and, and children into massively difficult situations because of the gospel. He was a maniac. The Bible says that Paul wreaked havoc in the church. Any Christian that Paul could get his hands on, he would get his hands on them and put them away. Paul was a vile man, a blasphemer against God. He sinned against God with a high hand. He, he didn't, he, he, Paul had, Paul had no, uh, 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 he had, Paul had no reservation about taking people and putting them to death or in prison and separating families. Paul was a, a mean and vile and wicked man. In fact, he had letters they were giving him permission to head to a place called Damascus to arrest some Christians. And as he was going on that road, all of a sudden Jesus showed up. And Jesus appeared to Saul in a great light. And the Bible says that he said, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And Saul asked the two greatest questions that every one of us ought to ask. First, he said, who art thou, Lord? And he said, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? Who are you and what do you want me to do? And boy, those are the two greatest questions you could ever ask. That I may know him, that I may know who you are, and then that I may do what you've called me to do. And Paul was changed. He was changed on the Damascus Road in a mighty way, a powerful way, in a transformed way. He was mightily changed. In fact, a few days later, he was, he was, he, the scales fell off his eyes and Paul was baptized. And Paul immediately, immediately the Bible said, straightway he began to preach Christ in the synagogue. God. Straightway, he began to go tell everybody about Jesus. Not long ago, a man came to our church, and and uh, and uh, he he came into our church, and he's something else. I, I've I've grown to I've grown to love him and pray for him. He his his grandfather founded Waffle House. Anybody ever eaten at a Waffle House? Listen to me, those of us who eat regularly at Waffle Houses, we have immunities to every kind of disease that you know to man. But man, he got saved. And after he got saved, he, 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 he texts me or calls me or emails me. And he's like, he said, Pastor Miller, I've been reading, man, John 3, 18. Isn't that a, I mean, have you ever read that before? I mean, this is an amazing thing. John, I mean, Pastor, have you ever read John 1 through 5? I mean, this is so true. I mean, this is an amazing thing. He said, uh, I, I'm a newborn Christian. And I want to suggest that next Sunday we sing a song, Go Tell It on the Mountain. I mean, he just wants to tell everybody. He called me yesterday while I was here, and he said, he said, listen, I, I'm, I know I'm just a baby in my diapers, but I want to be a warrior for Jesus. He said, is there a way I can get a stack of Bibles? I just want to go down to the college campus and hand it out. I mean, do you understand what we have? This is what he told me yesterday. He said, do you understand what we have? And it's the greatest thing you can get, and it's free. It's free. I want everybody to know it. Listen, Paul was radically changed on the Damascus Road and straightway he began to preach Jesus in the synagogue. Paul called himself the chief of sinners and yet Jesus saved him. Paul was indebted to Christ. Hey, young people, so are you. Let me tell you, the Bible says that Jesus came and he came into this world to save sinners. And salvation may be free and easy for us. Salvation may be a simple thing for us, but let me tell you, it wasn't for Jesus. The Bible said of Jesus that he came here and he was born of a virgin. And Jesus lived 33 years of a sinless life. Jesus walked on these dusty streets. He left the streets of gold to walk the streets of dust. He left the cheers of angels, holy, 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 to come to the jeers of ungodly men. Crucify him, crucify him, crucify him. Listen to me, Jesus Christ paid a debt for you. He paid the sin debt for you. He paid a payment that you could not pay. Jesus loved you enough to give himself for you. Amen. Do you know what Jesus did for you? Crucifixion was a vicious death. It was a humiliating death. Jesus was brought to a false trial and false witnesses lied about him. 
Pilate asked Jesus, what is truth? What is the truth? Jesus is the truth. Amen. And he sat on trial with lies. The God of heaven in human flesh, the embodiment of all that is true and holy, was lied about. Jesus was blindfolded and in that mock trial, they began to spit on him. They said, well, if you're really the son of God, then as they took their hands and beat him in the face, they said, prophesy and tell us who, who smote you. They began to beat his face, perhaps loosening the teeth. His beard was plucked from his face. They called him the king of the Jews, they said. The soldiers that were there said, oh, he's a king. Every king needs a crown. They found the thorns that grow in Jerusalem and they took that thorny bush and they plaited and made a crown of thorns. Friend, these thorns are massive thorns. They placed that upon Jesus' head and they smote him with a reed. Hail thou king of the Jews! As they smote him, driving those thorns deep into his brow, piercing through his flesh. The Bible said of Jesus that his face was so beaten and so marred that you could not see that he was a man. Then he was taken to the scourging post. What a cruel instrument the cat of nine tails was. A piece of leather with nine strands of leather interwoven with sharp pieces of stone and metal, perhaps bone. And the victim's back was made bare and hands were bound and pulled up on a post until the feet were just barely touching the ground and the back was taunt. And then the soldier would take that cat of nine tails, that leather strand with nine whips coming off the end of it, and they would take that bare taunt back and he would bring that forward and bring that whip into his back. Often in the Roman scourgings, they would not pull it back, but they would pull it down the victim's back, ripping the flesh. That's why the psalm said of Jesus, they plowed furrows in my back. They didn't hit him just once or twice, 39 times. In those Roman scourgings, oftentimes victims would die in the scourging. But Jesus was still alive because no man took his life. He laid it down for us. And there with his back cut to ribbons, the open flesh, perhaps being able to even see into the muscles and the sinew and the organs. To keep him alive for crucifixion, the Romans would have taken salt and thrown it into his wounds and wrapped him then in a purple garment. They led him away to crucify him. Jesus stumbling under that cross as the crowd cursed him and spat upon him and kicked him. And finally, one Simon was brought out to carry that cross. As they carried the cross to the place of Jesus' crucifixion, the cross would have been laid down and fastened to that center beam and Jesus would have been stripped naked and his bare back that had just been beaten to ribbons would be laid upon that cross. Those Roman soldiers would take his hands and stretch them out on that wood and hold him down with their shoes as they positioned that hand on the cross as they took a spike and put that spike in one hand and the thud of the hammer and then the other. And then the bending of the feet and the nail into the feet. And then as those soldiers would take that cross and with ropes they would raise it up into the sky. 
dragging the base of that cross near the hole that was prepared for it. And as that cross became skyward and that cross fell into that hole as it ended its descent at the bottom of that hole with a sickening thud, the Bible would say that his bones would come out of joint. The psalmist said that his bones came out and stared at him. And there with that bloody back and that beaten face and that crown of thorns and the nails and the hands and the feet, now for hours he would have to lift himself on those nails to take his breath. He would lift himself breath after breath to take a breath to pull himself up to take the breath to say, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. As they sat down there and they watched him, they just sat around and just watched Jesus die, wagging their heads at him having the thieves and the malefactors on each side cursing him. They joined in the throng and they cursed him. And as Jesus hung in agony, now the sun grew dark. In the middle of the day, it was as dark as midnight. God had to pull a curtain over the sun because now it was God's turn. The Bible said in Isaiah that it pleased Jehovah God to bruise him. And now in one man, in one place, and at one time, he had become sin for us. The sin of every man now upon his body. The sin of every man from Adam to the last man. My sin and your sin. Adultery and fornication and vileness and, and, uh, and idolatry and homosexuality and drunkenness and drug addictions and pornography and all of the sin and the, all all of the world from every man and every woman and every boy and every girl was placed on Jesus and in one body on one tree in one place was all the sin of the world and God judged it. And God judged it and in that judgment in the piercing darkness a voice cried out, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. My God, my God. Why hast thou forsaken me? God poured an eternity of wrath on Jesus on that cross. Not for his sins. He who knew no sin became sin for us. He knew no sin. For he in his own body on the tree suffering for my sin and your sin. As the sun grew light, Jesus cried with a loud voice, It is finished! The payment was paid. It was hastening on in the day. They could not leave those bodies on the cross because of the Sabbath. And so they came to the two thieves and they broke their legs so they could no longer draw breath and hasten their death when they came to Jesus. He had already spoken those words, Father, into thy hands commit thy my spirit. And Jesus bowed his head and gave up the ghost. When they came to Jesus and they saw that he was already dead so that the prophecy would be fulfilled that not a bone of him should be broken, they took the spear and thrust it through his side. And out of his side flowed blood and water. And there Jesus hung in naked open shame, dead. The price for sin. 
Joseph of Arimathea took that body. He washed it. He and Nicodemus carried that body. They wrapped it and anointed it and placed it in Joseph's tomb. And there he lay for three days dead. He who was the life and the resurrection dead. He who gave life to Lazarus dead. He who lights every man that cometh into the world is dead. And Paul looks back at Calvary to that wounded, bleeding, suffering body. And Paul said, I am deader. I am deader for the price that Jesus paid. Are you indebted to Christ? Are you indebted to Jesus? Do you see him suffering for your sin? I am debtor. I am debtor to take that message to the barbarian. I am debtor to take that message to the Greek. I am debtor to take that to the wise and the unwise, the learned and the unlearned, the ignorant, the heathen, the ungodly, those who are vile and wicked in the deepest, darkest places and to the highest places. I'll stand before kings and I'll go to the homeless, but I am a debtor to take that message of that death to every man in the world. I am debtor. I'm debtor. I'm obligated to the gospel. And then he said in verse 15, I am ready. He said in verse 15, so as much as in me is, I am ready to preach the gospel to you that are at Rome also. He said, everything that is in me, everything that is in me, I am ready to preach the gospel. Listen, not only was Paul obligated as a debtor, but Paul was waiting for any opportunity. He was ready. He was ready. You give Paul the opportunity, and Paul was going to run straight to Calvary. You give Paul the opportunity, he was going to tell you about Jesus. You give Paul a moment, you give him one opportunity, and Paul was going to open his mouth and preach Jesus to every man. He was ready for any opportunity. Amen. Paul said, for to me to live is Christ. For to me to live is Christ. Paul, what is life all about? It's about Christ. Paul, how do you do what you do? He said, I don't. I'm crucified. I'm crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. And I'm ready to tell the world that, that message. What made Paul so ready? What made Paul so ready? Paul had been changed. Paul had been transformed. He said, everything that is in me, everything that is in me. Remember what Paul said? Remember what Paul was going to write in just a few chapters? Paul was going to write in Romans chapter 7. He said, for in me that is in my flesh dwelleth no good thing. Who shall deliver me from the body of this death? Oh, wretched man that I am. I thank God through Jesus Christ. Listen to me. Paul said, there is nothing good in me but Christ in me. And he said, and now with everything that's in me, I'm ready to go preach the gospel. You know what Paul was saying here? He said, I'm ready to preach the gospel because I have a changed life and I am part of the evidence that Jesus is the Savior. Let me ask you a question. Is your life ready to preach the gospel? Are you ready to preach the gospel? Are you living a transformed life? Have you been changed by the power of Christ in such a way that you are part of the evidence? Hey, young people, listen, we haven't been called to be the judges. And we haven't been called to be the attorneys. We, God didn't call us down here to argue the case. Oh, listen to me. We are not the judges and we are not the attorneys. We are the witnesses. And we are able to stand and tell the court what Jesus has done for us. Are you ready to tell the gospel? Are you ready to give the gospel? Paul was ready for any opportunity. Paul had given his life to the gospel. Paul had said, I count not my life dear unto myself. Hey, let me tell you this. Let me tell you this. You know that you are not really, really ready to live all out for Christ until you're ready to die for Christ. 
And Paul was ready to die for Christ. I'm not talking about putting yourself, I'm not talking about somebody who's a martyr and they're just, they're just, they're just, they got a weird, they got a weird sense of, you know, I want to die. No, no. Paul didn't want to die. He wanted to live and he wanted to live. And he said, I could, he said, I, I, I have, I'm, I'm in a, I'm in a fix between two. He said, I want to depart and go to be with Christ, which would be far better. But so I can be here with you and I can preach the gospel. I want to stay here as much as in me is. I'm ready to preach the gospel. I know I'm going to heaven, and I can't wait to go to heaven. But while I'm here, I want to preach the gospel. I want to tell others about Jesus. Paul was ready. Paul had no hindrances to the gospel. Hey, did you hear what I said, young people? Listen to me. Paul had no hindrances in his life to the gospel. Paul had made sure that he was living ready to preach the gospel. He wasn't with his friends living one way on Saturday and then going to church and being a different kind of person on Sunday. No, listen to me. He was living for Christ and ready to preach the gospel. There are some young people in this room tonight. You need to get your heart right with God because you are a hindrance to the gospel. You say that you're saved, but you're living away in front of your friends that is a hindrance to gospel. You're putting things on social media that hinder the gospel. I wonder if somebody got your Instagram feed or your TikTok feed and they went through your social media. I wonder if there's enough, if there's enough message on there for somebody to know Christ. What are you doing with the people who follow you? What are you, what are you doing with your life? What is the message of your life? What are, you, what are you displaying about your life? Are you ready to share the gospel? Are you living in such a way that one of your, if one of your friends came to you and said, hey, could you tell me about Jesus? Could you do it? Could you do it without stutter, without stammer, without hesitation? Are you living ready? David Livingston, one of the greatest missionaries David Livingston said this in a prayer to God. He said, Lord, send me where you will, but go with me. Lay any burden on my heart, but sustain me. Sever any tie, but the one that binds my heart to thee. You know, young people, listen to me. You're going to hear the call of God in your life this week. There are some of you that your, your, your world is on its way to hell. Your generation is dying and perishing in a world of fake news and false realities. And they're walking through a world of social media where everything is, everything is plastic and everything is facade. And they're scrolling through a world of fallacy and fantasy and fakeness. There are filters on everything. And young people, let me just say a word about that. You better be very careful in this world. You're going to go through life, going through everybody else's life and looking at it through their filters while you're walking through your own life unfiltered. And this world is looking for reality. What is truth? The politicians don't have an answer. The politicians want power and money and, and greed for themselves and control over the lives of the people and, and they want to dominate for their own greed and their own power. There is no answer today in politics. There's no answer today in economy. Money's not the answer. The world knows it. For a few years they have money in their pockets and then we go through years where gas prices are like $700. I had a guy call me the other day from, I live about an hour from Denver, and he called me the other day and said, hey, would you come preach for me on a Friday night? And I said, sure, I'd be glad to, I'd love to. He said, listen, we're gonna, we'll take good care of you. We'll give you $50 for speaking and $500 for gas. <laughs> Money's not the answer. Money's like a, a bird, it grows wings and flies away. Somebody said, man, money talks. It does, it says bye. <laughs> There's no answer in the White House. There's no answer in Washington. There's no answer in the world. There's no answer in money. There's no answer in science. I mean, we don't even, we can't even trust science anymore. Science is just whatever we want to say tomorrow. Where's the truth in this generation? Truth has fallen in the streets and there needs to be some young people that answer the call of God in your life and say, I know the truth. He is the truth. He is the way. He is the life. And you can go to God by Him. You can know God through Jesus Christ. 
God's going to speak to your heart. Listen, where are the pastors in this room? Where are the missionaries in this room? Where are those who give their life to service for the gospel and say, I'm ready, I'm ready. There's only one thing to live for, and that's the gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen. What if God called you? Are you willing to sever ties? Are you willing to say, Lord, send me anywhere. Only go with me. Lord, put a burden on my heart. Only sustain me. Lord, sever any tie except the tie that binds me to your heart. God, use me. I am ready. Are you ready to do whatever it takes for the gospel? We have a world out there that's hungry. They're looking. They're searching. And you have it. Let me say lastly today, Paul said, I am a debtor and I am ready. Look at verse number 16. Paul had just said, I'm ready to preach there at Rome also. And then verse 15, he said, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. Now, why would Paul say that? You see, Paul was debtor. He was obligated to the gospel. Paul was ready. He was looking for any opportunity for the gospel, but Paul was also not ashamed. He did not fear the opposition to the gospel. And let me tell you, young people, there's an opposition to the gospel. There's an opposition to the gospel. Paul said, I want to come to Rome and preach the gospel there. Oh, listen, what a task it would be to come to Rome. May I remind you what Paul was going to do? He was going to come to Rome, the house of the Senate. He was going to come to Rome, the place of the Caesars. He was going to come to Rome, the seat of the power of the Roman Empire. And he was going to preach about a Jewish carpenter who was rejected by his own and who was crucified on a Roman cross, beaten by a Roman whip, stabbed by a Roman centurion, put into a Roman tomb with the Roman seal and he was going to come and preach about a man who had died at the hand of Rome, rejected by the hand of the Jews, a man who was suffering and in shame and rejected. He was not a philosopher. He was not an educator. He was not a politician. He was a carpenter and Paul was going to roll into Rome and preach about that. Yeah. And I'm not ashamed to do it. I'm not ashamed to stand before the Agrippas and the Felixes and the Festuses. I'm not ashamed to appeal unto Caesar. I'm not ashamed to take my case and to go to Rome and to preach the gospel to the very people who had a hand in his death. It's estimated that since Adam until now, there's been some 60 to 70 billion people who've lived on the planet. We're about 8 billion right now. 60 to 70 billion people on the planet. Out of all of those billions, there's only been a handful of people who've revolutionized the world in medicine and in politics and in philosophy. There's only been a few great military leaders in the world who've dominated the world scene. But do you know what Paul said? Paul said, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. He talked about the person of the gospel. Let me tell you something. It's Christ's gospel. It's not our gospel. It's his gospel. It belongs to Christ, and he is the person. And do you know, out of 60 to 70 billion people that have lived on this planet, <laughs> there has been not one person ever who's had more books written about him. He never wrote a book himself while he lived on this earth, and yet there's not been a man. I mean, I've got a library at home, and I can't find another place for another book about Jesus. More books have been written about that man. He never led an army, and yet there's never been a man who more people were willing to die for than Jesus. <laughs> he never, he never, he never taught in any university or had any great, any great wisdom of, uh, of man's philosophy. But can I tell you, his teachings have circled this world time and time again. Men follow his teaching. Men would follow him to their death. Men follow Christ. And Paul said, listen, that rejected Jewish carpenter, that one who died on a Roman cross, that one who was scourged, that is the same one who on day three came out of that grave alive. And I'm following him. I am a follower of Jesus Christ. And I am not ashamed about it.
I follow Jesus and I'm not ashamed about it. I follow a man who was despised and rejected. I follow a man who was spat upon and lied about and crucified in shame, but he's also the one who came out of that grave alive, victorious over sin, over death and over the grave, and he lives today and he's coming back one day. I serve that person. I follow Jesus and I'm not ashamed of it. Paul said, I'm not ashamed of the person of the gospel. Then he said in verse 16, look at it, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation. He said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel because of the purpose of the gospel. The purpose of the gospel is the salvation of men's souls. Listen to me very carefully, young people. Jesus did not come into this world to die just to get you into heaven. Jesus came to this earth to die and buried and rose again, to get heaven into you, to cast away your sin, to give you a new heart, to change you into an image in the likeness of his dear son. Jesus came to transform you and to change you and to give you an eternal life. That gospel has a purpose. It is to deliver you and thou shalt call his name Jesus for he shall save his people from their sins. Jesus came to deal with sin. Man doesn't have an education problem. Man doesn't have a racial problem. Man doesn't have any kind of social problem. Man has a sin problem. The problem in the world today is not because we're not tolerant on all the sexual identities. Our problem is we have a sin problem. Our problem is a sin problem. And let me tell you, you deal with man's sin and you change the man and you change that man forever into the image of Christ, you have delivered that man for eternity. That's the purpose of the gospel. It is the power of God unto salvation. Paul said, I'm not ashamed not only of the person of the gospel, Jesus, and I'm not ashamed of the purpose of the gospel for salvation. He said, I'm not ashamed of the power of the gospel. It's the power of God. You know, we like to talk about power in our world today. You know, we got jet engines that power. We got rocket engines that go to Mars. We got power in this world, atomic power, nuclear power. I mean, Putin's talking about blowing up the world with nuclear power. Can I tell you something? This isn't his world. He didn't bring it in and he ain't taking it out. The Bible says that that world belongs to God and it's held and reserved for the day of judgment. Let me tell you, when this world is ready to go, it won't be climate change and it won't be just because somebody let off a nuclear war. It's going to be because God did it. We talk about power today. I don't care how strong of a bomb you have, you could put that bomb on your chest and let it blow you to smithereens and vaporize your body. But let me tell you something. It might vaporize you, but it would never knock sin out of your heart. There's only one power that can deal with the great disease of man, and that's the power of God. <laughs> oh, and let me tell you this. Paul said, I'm not ashamed of the person. I'm following, the, I'm following Jesus. I'm not ashamed of the purpose. I've been saved. I'm not ashamed of the power. That's God's power. And he said, I'm not ashamed of the plan of the gospel. The plan. Well, what's the plan of this gospel? Look at verse number 16. He said, it is the power of God unto salvation. And watch this, to every one that believeth. You know what the plan of the gospel is? to take the power of God in the person of Jesus Christ and through his death, burial, and resurrection to overcome sin in every person that believes. They don't have to work for it. They don't have to earn it. They don't have to get baptized and give money to the church. They don't have to come and get, listen, listen to me. You can come to church and you can eat the Lord's Supper until you, until you get fat and sassy. You can get baptized so many times until you come up wrinkled like a raisin. There's not enough juice and crackers in the closet of the deacon's closet. There's not enough water in the baptistry tank to wash away your sin. But let me tell you something right now. The plan of God is when a sinner is confronted with his sin and he turns to Jesus by faith and repentance and he looks to Christ to live. There is a power that worketh in that, that that man who took faith, God brings in grace and God does a work in that man's soul that eradicates sin from his heart, breaks the bondage of sin and changes that man forever. I'm a debtor. Sixty-three years ago, a young man, 18 years old, 
married a girl 16 years old. In Deer Lodge, Montana, this young boy and this young girl got married. This young man came from a home that was full of alcohol and drunkenness. That 16-year-old girl, she grew up in the home of a single mom. That girl's mom was the town drunk in Red Lodge, Montana. When she was seven and eight years old, she'd have to go down to the saloon and help walk her mom home in the Montana blizzards. Her mom was a terrible drunk. She married an 18-year-old man that she thought was the man of her dreams. I want to show you a picture of their wedding day. They got married in a little house. He doesn't look so bad. She doesn't look so bad. They came from really broken homes. That young man at 18 years old, he was already drinking so much that he couldn't, he couldn't start the day without a six-pack of beer. He had broken horses for a living, rode in rodeos, grew up on a farm and a ranch in eastern Montana. Tough. They got married. A couple years into their marriage, they had a baby girl. A year later, a year later had another baby girl. A year later, they had a baby boy. And now this young couple in their early 20s, trying to raise a family, 23, 24 years old, the pressures of life, he was drinking more and more. He'd become a mechanic at the Chevrolet dealership in Red Lodge, Montana. They began to fall apart in their marriage. That man is my dad and that's my mom. My dad went to work on a Friday. It was payday. He got paid, went to the Wagon Wheel Saloon downtown, and my dad spent every bit of his paycheck drinking and partying and hanging out with his friends. My mom was at home with three little kids trying to find money for food and shoes. She knew that my dad got paid that day. She went down looking for him. He didn't ever come home, so she went looking for him. Went down to the saloon where she thought she'd find him, and she found him laying out there in a white T-shirt, laying on the gutter, covered in his own vomit, drunk. She'd grown her up, up around that all her life. She had these little kids at home who were hungry. She looked at this man in the gutter she kicked him. She told him, you make me sick. Monday morning, he was served with papers for divorce, which just led him to drinking. My mom took the three kids and moved out. She moved in with her sister across town. They were separated, waiting for all the divorce proceedings to go through. It was a little harder in those days to get a divorce. What they didn't know was that my mom was expecting a baby. During their time of separation, my mom had that baby, their fourth baby, a little baby boy named Dace. Dace was born with a hole in his heart. In our world today, they could fix that easily. They could go in while she was still pregnant and fix that. Back in 1965, they couldn't do that. My mother never got to hold that little baby. He was born with a hole in his heart. He was immediately taken to a pediatric ICU. He was put on all kinds of machines. Back in 1965, they didn't really have the technology to keep that kid alive. And their little boy laid in that place for a month, and then he died. My dad had kind of grown up somewhat Catholic. My mom had grown up somewhat Mormon. They weren't very religious. They only had enough of the wrong doctrine to not know anything. Their life was rapidly devolving.
My dad was drinking more and broken. My mom and dad had to bury that baby by themselves. They went to the funeral home. They didn't have enough money for a full funeral or even a casket. The funeral director gave them a styrofoam coffin. They put that baby in it. My dad borrowed a friend's station wagon. They loaded that little coffin in the back of that station wagon. And my mom and dad together drove out to the cemetery. And my dad hand dug the grave. My mom said to me, and years later, she said, you know, son, dad and I were so broken, we never spoke one word to each other that day. They rode out there in the car, they buried that baby, they drove away from that grave. My dad never held my mother's hand, he never spoke a comforting word. My mother wept with a broken heart, a broken home, a broken life, and no hope. My dad was working at the Chevrolet garage and there was a man who had come from Deer Lodge, who had come to uh, Montana from Denver, Colorado. He had come to start a church. And in order to start that church, he had to work a second job. So he worked at the Chevrolet garage with my dad. He had tried to witness to my dad before my dad rejected everything he tried to do. And my dad came to work the day after the burial of their baby. My dad came to work. Bill Wickham met him at the door with tears in his eyes. He said to my dad, he said, Dean, I had no idea what you were going through. Some of the men told me today that you're separated from your wife and your baby died. And with tears in his eyes, he said to my dad, I've prayed for you today. He said, I wish you would read this. And he gave my dad a gospel track called What Must I Do to Be Saved? My dad took the track, threw it over on the workbench, got busy working that day sat down for his lunch break and he saw that track, what must I do to be saved, what must I do to be saved? My dad picked up that track and began to read it. God began to work in his heart. He didn't want Bill Wickham to know that he was curious about all this stuff. So he thought, I'm just gonna ask him a few questions and just hope he doesn't know that I'm interested. So he went to ask Bill Wickham some questions and Bill Wickham said, hey, let me give you a ride home after work today. He said, all right. So my dad went home with Bill Wickham and. Bill Wickham is sitting in the front seat of his car with my dad. He's got his Bible open and he's showing my dad how to be saved. Out of the blue, my mom comes walking up the street. She needed to get some clothes from the house. My dad said, hey, here comes my wife. Now, Bill Wickham's never met my mom before, but he jumped out of that car. And he said, are you Jerry Miller? And she said, yes, who are you? And he said, I'm, I'm Bill Wickham. I work with your husband. He's sitting right here in the car. I, I'm a pastor. And I've just been showing your husband from the Bible how you could know for sure you could see your baby again one day. Would you like to know that? My mom said, more than anything in the world. He took my mom and dad into a room, into their house. My mom sat on this side of him. My dad sat on that side of him. They weren't speaking. And he took the old Bible and began to show them for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. The wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son for us that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. But God commended his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. He said, Dean and Jerry, do you know that you're sinners? Yes. Do you believe that Jesus died for you and rose again? Yes. Do you believe that if you received him by faith right now that Jesus would save you? Oh, yes. For the first time in months, my mom and dad knelt down at the couch and they put hand in hand they received Jesus Christ as their Savior. Not long after that, my dad and mom were going to church. They got baptized in Montana in October. It was freezing cold. They were growing in the Lord, and my dad got called to preach, and my dad moved to Denver, Colorado, and another great thing happened in their life. They had me. And oh, listen, mom and dad began to serve the Lord. My dad became a pastor and started a church when I was two years old. He had been in ministry prior to that. My dad's preached the gospel for over 50 years. 
Pastor of the same church for 40 years. Married to my mother for 63 years. That little broken home girl got to go around the world and preach all over the world. My dad, we listened to my dad preach. She got to go on missions trips all over the world. She lived like a queen. My dad treated her like a princess. He was a change man. God had transformed him from an old drunk in the gutter to a preacher in the pulpit. My mother was one of the most godly women I've ever met. This last February, I want to show you a picture of my mom. She's a beautiful mama. My mom began to, she was always such a healthy person, but she got some trouble breathing. And she went to the doctor and they began to do some tests and she was diagnosed with pulmonary fibrosis, hardening of her lungs. My mom struggled with that for about a year. She went on oxygen full time and it was so hard to see a mom who was always so healthy. My mom was never sick. I don't ever remember my mom being sick, but seeing her dragging an oxygen tank around and not being able to do what she used to do. And she just began to decline. And I had a doctor in my church that was trying to treat my mom and they had come up to our area and were coming to see the doctor and he met my mom and dad at the hotel and he took a look at my mom and he looked at me and said, we need to call an ambulance. My mom's oxygen levels were very low. She was very weak. We took her to the hospital. She went into the ICU and had to be put on a permanent breathing apparatus. And once she got her oxygen levels up, she was in great condition. There was nothing wrong with her brain. There was nothing wrong with her kidneys. There was nothing wrong with her heart. She was in good health except for her lungs. On Tuesday, my dad and I stayed with her. She could only have two people stay with her a day. My dad and I stayed on Tuesday. My other brother came up on Wednesday, and he and dad stayed Wednesday. I had another brother come on Thursday, and they stayed together. My other sister came on Thursday, and, and then I had another sister on Friday. And my, my mom and dad got to, my mom got to spend a day with every one of her kids. On Thursday, the doctor came in, and we had, made a, we had made a pact as a family, as brothers and sisters, that whenever the doctor came in, we would voice record the conversation so that we knew what the doctors were saying. And so the doctor came in on Thursday and was talking to my mom. My mom said, just tell me, tell me this. What, just just give, me, give me the straight. Am I going home? And the doctor said, Ms. Miller, you're, you're not going to go home. You, you can't leave this hospital and you can't breathe without this machine. And there's no way for you to go home. And she said, well, doc, I want you to know something. I am going home. And he said, no, no, you're not going home. She said, oh, yes, I am going home. And I want you to go with me. He said, well, where do you live? <laughs> we have it on recording. We played it at her funeral. And he said, well, where do you live? And she said, oh, I'm not talking about my home. I'm talking about my home. I'm going home. And for nine minutes, my mother, between deep gasps of breath for nine minutes, she preached the gospel to that man. She'd given every nurse in that hospital gospel tracts every time they came in her room. She preached the gospel to that doctor. And on Saturday morning, my dad and my brother were on the way to the hospital. My mom called me. She said, Dean, has your dad left to come up here yet? And I said, yes, ma'am, they just left. She said, son, listen to me very carefully. I'm ready to go. She said, now... Uh, I, when your dad gets here, I'm going to talk to him because I need his permission. But I just want to make sure that when, my, when I go, you're going to take care of your dad. I said, Mom, we, we don't want you to go. She said, oh, I know, son. I know you don't. And I know you've been praying for me to get better, but in John 17, Jesus has been praying for me to be where he is. And he always gets his prayers answered. <laughs> she said, I'm ready, son. I want to go see Jesus. I don't know what you tell your mom in that situation. I just said, Mom, I love you, and we'll take good care of Dad. My dad got there, and they had their talk, and it took a couple of hours, but Dad finally agreed and said, it's, it's okay to go. The doctor called all of us and let all of us come in, so all of us kids are standing around my mom's bed. They came in and they told us, they said, now this is not an easy way to watch somebody die. 
it's very difficult when they can't breathe and just want everybody to know. My mom said, oh, doc, we've already talked about that. It's going to be fine. She said, I'm not afraid to die. And there's no fear in this. It's okay. So the doctors begin to turn off all the machines and unplug everything for my mom. And my mom had talked to all of us already and just talked to each one of us personally. And then she looked at my dad and she said, I love you, hon. It's the last thing she said in this world. She looked at my dad and said, I love you, hon. She put her head on that pillow and my mom just closed her eyes and she just began to sleep and just kind of breathe slowly. And we watched for about 45 minutes and she just never gasped, never struggled, never fought, just fell asleep. In that moment that she took her last breath, <laughs> that soul left that body. She was present with the Lord. And she took a breath of a new kind of air. And she was seeing light like she'd never seen before. Oh, we wept. My dad opened the Bible to Revelation 14. He opened my mom's Bible that was laying on her bed. He opened that up and he read these words, Blessed are the dead which die in the Lord from henceforth, for they shall cease from their labors and their works do follow them. As a family, we stood around my mom's bed and we began to sing, How beautiful heaven must be Sweet home of the happy and free. Fair haven of rest for the weary. How beautiful heaven must be. We prayed. We walked out the door. There was a line of hospital staff. The tears coming down their face. They said, we've, we've never seen anyone die like that. <laughs> I said, she didn't die. She fell asleep. She's with the Lord. You know why? Because there was somebody not ashamed of the gospel. And a man was ready to go and live in a place in Montana and work a job as a mechanic as he tried to start a church and tell old drunken men about Jesus. And the power of God changes lives in the gospel. We need a generation of young people to rise up tonight and say there's a dying world on their way to hell that need the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I'm a debtor, I'm a debtor, I'm a debtor. I'm ready, I'm ready. I'm not ashamed to tell the gospel of Jesus Christ. Are you ashamed of the gospel? Tonight there needs to be a great move in every heart tonight about the gospel of Jesus Christ. And some of you tonight, you're sitting here and you're lost. If it was your time to go and your time to die, you would be so fearful and you would fight and you would be afraid and you would, you would strive to live and you would say, no, do everything you can to keep me alive. I don't want to die. I don't want to die. You don't know Jesus as your Savior. You've never been to Calvary. You've never had sin taken out of your heart. You've never known the peace of God and the righteousness of God and a relationship with Jesus Christ. But you can know him tonight because of the gospel. I want every head bowed and every eye closed for just a moment, very quietly. Don't, don't disturb, don't, don't move around. How many of you in this room right now would say, Pastor Miller, I know that 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 I know without one shadow of a doubt that I know that Jesus Christ has saved me and I know that I'm born again and on my way to heaven. Would you slip your hand way up high right now? I know that I know, well, what a sight. Praise God for the gospel, that the gospel came to you, that the gospel came to you. Somebody gave you the gospel. And young people, listen to me. You're a debtor. 
You're a debtor. You may lower your hands. How many of you that just raised your hands would say, Pastor Miller, I've not been faithful to share the gospel. I've been ashamed to share the gospel with my friends at school and neighbors on my street. And I've not been living for the gospel. I've been living a slothful life. And, and God has been speaking to my heart tonight about the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I'm ready to share the gospel. I, I want to live unashamed of the gospel. I want to live for Jesus Christ. I want to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. And God has spoken to my heart tonight. Would you slip your hand way up high? Way up high. Way up high. Oh, that's a, what a wonderful sight. Listen to me. In just a moment, I'm going to give you an opportunity to deal with that, with the Lord. But you may lower your hands. I want to see tonight who said, Pastor Miller, I couldn't raise my hand a moment ago because I don't know that I'm saved tonight. I don't know Jesus Christ as a personal Savior. If I died tonight, I, I, I wouldn't go to heaven. If I died tonight, I would go to hell to pay for my own sin. But I don't want to. I want to know Jesus Christ as Savior. Pastor Miller, that's me. I'm going to be honest tonight. That's me. I don't know Christ. Would you slip your hand way up high? I don't know Jesus. God bless you. Hands over here on my left in the back. Uh, in the back, back over here. Just slip your hand way up high. I'm not going to embarrass you. I'm not going to embarrass you. Just slip your hand way up high. I don't know Jesus Christ as Savior. Over on my left. Over here on my left. Back over here on my right. Down here in the front. Back over here in the back. Way in the back in the back right. God bless you. Keep your hands up. Keep your hands up. You say, I don't know for sure if I died tonight that I would go to heaven. I don't know that for sure, but I want to. I want to know that my sins are forgiven. I want to know that I have a new life in Christ. I want Jesus to save me. Just slip your hand way up high. Way up high. Way up high. Those of you that have your hands raised in just a moment, I'm going to give an invitation. Now listen to me very carefully. If you need to be saved in just a moment, I'm going to give an invitation. I'm going to ask those who raise their hand that are saved, I'm going to ask them to come and to deal with God about the gospel and about their call, that they would not be ashamed, that they would share the gospel. But before they come, you need to come very quickly. So I'm going to ask you to come first. I want you to step out and I want you to come to the front. There'll be people right down here in the front. You can go right to the back. There may be people in the back. I don't know where they'll be, but you come out of that seat and come to the front. And I want you to take somebody down here by the hand. Say, I don't know what to say. You don't have to say anything. You just come down here and catch their eye and go to them. Or you can say this, I want to be saved tonight. I want to be saved tonight. And they'll take the Bible and they'll show you some scriptures and then they'll have you make a decision about Christ and they'll seal that decision with a prayer. And you will come out of here tonight knowing Christ as your personal savior. There were many hands and some already coming and some already making a move and that's a wonderful thing. I'm gonna ask everyone in this room to stand if you're able to stand quietly to your feet. Don't disturb your neighbor. Our heads about our eyes are closed. I'm gonna give the Christians a moment just to hold your seat for just a moment. I'm gonna let those who raise their hand that don't know Christ as Savior, I want you to leave your seat very quickly right now. Just leave your seat. I'm gonna ask the piano to begin to play. Those that raise your hand, you don't know Christ as Savior, just leave your seat right now. Just step by some people. They'll move out of the way. Don't let anybody stand between you and eternity. Don't let anybody stand between you and salvation or you and forgiveness. Just leave your seat right now. If you can't get out of your row, in just a minute, others are going to be coming, and you come, and you find one of these men at the front or one of these ladies, and they'll show you how to be saved. You come right now, right now. Some are already coming. You don't need to be ashamed of it. Don't be ashamed. Jesus was not ashamed to take your sins on that cross. Don't you be ashamed of him. Many are coming right now. They're already coming. From the back over here on my left and the back over here on my right, I want you to come. Find your way to the front. Find someone in the front and say, I'm coming to be saved. If someone next to you raised their hand, offer to come with them. Offer to come with them and bring them to Christ. Don't be ashamed of the gospel. Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed right now. Young people, those of you that raised your hand a moment ago, that you know you're saved and you know that Christ has saved you, but you've been living ashamed or you've been living a life that's not been shedding, sharing the gospel with others. I want you to come to business. Maybe there's some sin in your life. You need to confess. You need to get right with God. Maybe you need to answer the call to preach, to be a missionary, to full-time Christian service. God wants your life and you're ready to give it. Whatever the case is, I want you to move right now. You move right now and you come all over this room. You raised your hand a moment ago. And I want you to step out of your seat and find a place to pray. Just come to the front. This altar's open right now. There were scores of you, hundreds of you that raised your hand. I want you to leave your seat right now. I want you to leave your seat right now. And I want you to come. And I want you to pray. And I want you to tell the Lord, I'm a, I don't want to live ashamed of the gospel. I don't want to live ashamed of the gospel. I don't want to live ashamed of the gospel. Young man, would you come tonight? Would you come tonight? You raised your hand to be saved. Would you come tonight? Let someone pray with you. Let someone pray with you.
you. God bless you. God bless you. I'm praying for you right now. I'm praying for you right now. You wanted to be saved, and God wants to save you. Brother Joy, right here, this young man right here wants to be saved. Right here. God bless you, sir. What a wonderful joy it is. Let's do business with the Lord tonight, young people. We need a generation of some young people serious about the gospel. much time as you need. If you need to pray with someone, there are, there are youth leaders and counselors that are standing up here. We're in no hurry. We're doing great on time. If God's doing something in your heart and you haven't come yet, there's still time for you too. Father God, thank you so much for your word to us, and thank you for how it was declared boldly tonight. God, I thank you for those who are in the back hallway right now who have heard the gospel and have responded and have begun that relationship with you tonight. I got to thank you for those who uh, have made a decision about being bold in their witness, maybe at home or at school. God, I pray that you would continue to work in our hearts. God, I know that the devil would love to undo everything uh, that you've done here. But God, we pray that this would just be the start of a great conference, uh, that we take the truths that we heard tonight and not soon forget them. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.